explain why you have to believe in miracles. So, I hope he doesn't mind me telling this, but two weeks ago, we had a miracle here. Marvin accepted the Lord as his Savior. Amen. And that's a miracle. That's like the greatest healing that can ever be had is when you step out of the darkness into the light. And so that's a victory. And uh, we have to, I mean, I have to share that with the family of Marvin. I really did have to share that because it was such an awesome, delightful moment. So, Mark chapter 6, 30 and 32 says this, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Verse 32, so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. So what was going on there is Jesus had sent the apostles out two by two on a ministry and they were to go out without him. He gave them certain instructions and then they reported, they came back to report what they had done, what they had taught. And that was why he, he, he had empathy for them because they needed to rest after that uh, time of ministry. And I've talked to other ministers, and I, I, you know, I always wondered if it was just me, but when I go home on Sunday, I just fall asleep because it's wearying. And it's because there's opposition. There's spiritual opposition to the ministry. And so other ministers tell me the same thing. They don't have, they'll fall asleep. The ones I've asked about that. They, they're weary when they go home after they preach, and it's because it's there's opposition. Just a spiritual opposition, just as there's a physical opposition if you're doing a task of some kind. But Mark, this is what happened before that. Mark chapter 6, 7 to 13, calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tu uh, shirt, tunic in the King James. Uh, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Verse 12, they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So the apostles who had been called, who had traveled around with Jesus, uh, who had been right there when Jesus performed miracles, were sent out to do what they had seen Jesus do. In other words, he commissioned them. Uh, to, to go and, and, and minister, not just to hang around with him, watch him do it. No, they were to go out and do it themselves, which, of course, they would have to do after he left. So they preached repentance. They drove out demons. They healed the sick, things that we still see happening today. Their ministry was successful. They accomplished great things without the physical presence of Jesus. Of course, the Holy Spirit was with them because there has to be a, a, a spirit of God to throw out demons and to cause healing. So, you know, the spirit was with them, but they were out, they able to, God was with them. They were able to do this. Um, you can't have successful ministry unless God is with you. So they went on this mission trip in the authority of Jesus, and they went out in faith. And when they returned to report to the master all they had done, Jesus would have known how taxing that ministry would have been. Ministry is a struggle. There's always opposition from the enemy who doesn't want us to make any inroads into uh, his evil world. 
This was the first time that the apostles went out to minister without Jesus. They gathered around him when they came back with great excitement, and they were probably very tired. Ministry is exhausting. So in verse 31 it says they didn't even have a chance to eat. So many people were thronging around there. So examining the verse, first of all, it says, come away. The press of the crowds was too much. Jesus allows, even bids, his followers to get away from the struggles at times. They were excited. Ministry has great rewards. There's nothing like it. It's also tiring because of the struggle, because of the opposition from the enemy. We are allowed, we're even encouraged to have a respite, to get away from the battle at times. And I'm not talking just about professional ministers. I'm talking about all of us who minister in some way or other. And, and uh, so we're all commissioned to do that. The apostles were energized to go forth to battle demons, impure spirits, and they drove them out. But they were only human, like us. We can't keep it up all the time. The enemy is unseen. Demons just don't go away, they don't disappear. They just get busy somewhere else or go against someone else or go against the gospel carrier or make trouble somewhere else against Christian people. But we can also be called to come away from a place where we can't minister or where he doesn't want us to minister. The example is Abraham. God told him to get out of his homeland. His home culture was a culture of idolatry. Get away from your homeland and go to a place I will show you, which was the land of Canaan. Your descendants will inherit the land of Canaan, which of course took place. But he was to leave his home culture, which was an idolatry culture. He was to get away from there. Where he was going, he wouldn't know the culture. He wouldn't know the language. He wouldn't know their customs. And God wanted him to go in there to actually to invade the enemy, the enemy's culture. The enemy had those people. And then he said, come with, with me. He had sent the apostles from his presence to minister. Now he will be with them in their rest. Matthew 11, 28 says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. We always have the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. Jesus is always with us. He's always there. Joshua 1, 9. <coughs> I will not command you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. He's always with us. He's there. Just knowing that God is with us is powerful. He's with us in trials. He's with us in struggles. He's with Boyd in the hospital. He's with us in the bleak, hard times. He's there. We're not alone. We don't ever have to feel like we're all alone. The enemy tries to make us think that, but he is a liar. That was a good place for a name in right there. <laughs> And then he said, by yourselves. Jesus was calling the apostles away from the crowd that was coming and going. As it said, they were coming and going. They were pressed. Um, there were always crowds coming to throng Jesus, and the apostles were always there. Jesus was a rock star. You know, he, he really was famous among the common people. But the uh, some of them may have been grieving because of the recent beheading of John the Baptist. It could have been. Some were curiosity seekers. 
people tend to flock around leaders who are offering something different than the same one. They seem to flock towards people who are, do, who are doing that. And Jesus was a celebrity among the common people. He had words that people could live by. He worked miracles. He cast out demons. He caused people with no hope of healing to be healed. There were those in the crowd who didn't need a miracle, but they wanted to see a miracle. Now the apostles were also, at this point, miracle workers. They had been out on the ministry and, and uh, on the mission field and they had worked miracles. And the Jews were living under Roman rule at that time and so some of the crowds probably thought that Jesus with his powers to do miracles would kick the Romans out and restore the kingdom of David to its original glory. People were hoping that he would do that because he had the power to cast out demons. They probably thought he could cast out the Romans, which he could have, but it wasn't the time for him to do that. So every crowd has people who don't think that they need a miracle, but they all need a miracle. They all need a miracle. Then he said, come to a quiet place to rest. Crowds are noisy. Excited people make a lot of noise. You know, there's nothing wrong with excitement, uh, depending on what they're excited about. Um, some are excited about athletic event. You don't see a quiet crowd at a football game. People don't aren't in there with a hush. Quiet, hush. You might see a touchdown. They don't do that. They're yelling and carrying on. They don't have painted faces and Banners they wave around and different things to be. I mean, I'm excited about ice cream. <laughs> ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. I'm excited about ice cream. I don't make a lot of noise about it. I don't go to the freezer and start jumping up and down and hollering and whooping and everything about my ice cream, but I, I'm excited about it. I just threw that in there. So you don't see a quiet, well, you shouldn't see a real quiet crowd in church service. You should. There should be amens and, you know, there, there should be noise going on about excitement about what God is doing. There, there really should. But we have a victory. You know, if your team wins the Super Bowl, people are going crazy. They're out in the streets jumping up and down, dancing around. We have the greatest victory in all of eternity. Jesus won it for us. And we say, Yea, Lord, instead of, you know, instead of really getting excited about it. Death, hell, and the grave are defeated. But all these things are not restful. Rest comes after the game, after the excitement. It comes after the event. Excitement is great, but rest is needed. In order to function properly, a body needs rest. You're in danger if you drive when you're tired, fall asleep at the wheel. Some people have to work double shifts because of COVID and they're going to be tired. They need their rest. Their efficiency has to go down. Their, their sharpness to make critical decisions isn't going to be there after all, this, after all these hours of, of a double shift, you know. And fatigue takes its cold toll. We're only human. The apostles would have to carry on the ministry after Jesus returned to heaven. And Jesus knew that they needed rest. There is an ultimate rest, referred in the Bible as God's rest, which he promised to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 12. 9 to 10, where it says, Since you have not yet reached the resting place and the inheritance the Lord your God is giving you, but you will cross the Jordan and settle in the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and he will give you rest from all your enemies around you so that you will live in safety. Rest from enemies. Peaceful living 
in a promised land, cross the Jordan. But the rebellious ones, you know, the ones, the generation that clamored for a golden calf because they, they murmured against Moses, they would not enter that rest. They would not enter it. They would all perish in the 40 years of wandering before they crossed the Jordan. Not all the, not all the people, but all the ones who were, let's say the men that were 20 or over, that, that the group that, that murmured against Moses would not enter. And their disobedience came from lack of faith. They didn't believe. They said, what happened to Moses? We don't know. We don't know what happened to this guy. Make us gods to worship. But without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please God. So fast forward to the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 3, 18 and 19, where it says, And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? This is referring back to the Old Testament. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Those are Paul's uh, writings in Hebrews. And, in, and it continues in chapter 4, verse 6 verses, where it says, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, talking about rest today, about God's rest, that promise still stands. Let us be careful that none of you be found to have been fallen short of it. Falling short of it is disobedience, which is what caused them uh, to fall short of being able to cross the Jordan. But disobedience comes from unbelief. Those who don't believe God and don't believe the gospel will fall prey to any thought or philosophy that comes to them. And the loss of the ultimate rest God's rest, which is to abide forever in God's heaven for eternity. Verse 2 says, For we have, for we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Mm -hmm. Verse 3 Now we who have believed enter that rest. Just as God has said, so I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet, his works have been finished since the creation of the world. Verse 4, for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. We're talking about rest today. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, uh, and that's in Hebrews 4, 7 to 8, God again set a certain day calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. So back to Hebrews 4, 9 to 11. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. So, God rested on the seventh day of creation because he was finished and he was satisfied. It says that it was good. He didn't need to improve on what he had done. His work is always perfect. God's work is always perfect. It doesn't need finishing. Verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Since their disobedience came from lack of faith, we must guard our hearts. The Bible says guard your heart so that disbelief does not come in and rob us 
of our reward. The rest is the reward that God has prepared for us when our work is finished, just as he rested when his work was finished. When would that be? Either when we depart for heaven or when the Lord returns to take us home. Home is where you get your rest. Home is where you are at rest. You go home, that's your sanctuary. Home in heaven is our ultimate rest, our ultimate rest with God. Now, that's because the battle then is over. The resistance is done. We can go home, just like <coughs> soldiers in a, in a, in a battle, in a, in a war, just wish they could go home. Just wish they could go home. Because home is a sanctuary place. It's a place of rest. So that's the ultimate rest, God's rest, entering God's rest. So, so there, two thoughts about rest. The rest that the weary carrier of the gospel, the weary soul winner, needs that rest. That's just not ministers. That's any believer who shares their faith, who carries the gospel. It's done in opposition. It's wearying, and you need rest. So the break, so to speak, from the pressures of the world, that rest that Jesus invited the apostles to go with him. That's that rest. And the rest, God's rest, is what we're going to have when we cross the Jordan. The Jordan is a symbolic crossing into heaven to the promise, our promised land across the Jordan is when we go to heaven. That will be our ultimate rest. That will be when we enter God's rest. It's, you know, it's just, when you think about that, about going to heaven and entering God's rest, and the battle is over, and you're finally home, that's an awesome thought. Amen. Finally home. The struggle is done. No more aches and pains, no more sorrows, no more fears, no more doubts, no more nothing. Just home. Just get to go home and stay there forever. Psalm 116, verse 7. Return to your rest, my soul. For the Lord has been good to you. Return to your rest, my soul. Matthew 11, 28 to 30, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, I can't be the only person in here that's weary today. We're living in trying times. Trying times. Troubling times we live in. You get tired just watching on TV the things that are going on in the world. Tired. It's tiring. But, but God is there with us. We're still human though. We still get tired of it. We still want it to go away and be done. We still want to have rest. But our rest is temporary. We'll have a permanent rest one day. It's going to be so awesome. But what about you? Are you weary? I am. From all the things that are going on. Crazy things in Washington. And crazy things. Now there's going to be some crazy stuff going on about the Supreme Court. Crazy stuff. Just tiring, crazy stuff. And this war thing is all you hear on TV all day long, war, war, war. It's wearying. And you worry about your kids and grandkids. It's wearying. It's wearying. So are you weary today? Are you weary? I can't be the only one. Find, you know, find a place to pray. Come, come and find a place to pray. And I'm just going to walk around here and pray for victory. 